things. Uh, we've had 14 Fed tightening cycles since 1950, 11 recessions out of the 14, but we have three soft landings, three soft landings in the mid 60s, mid 80s and mid 90s. In the mid 90s is when Alan Greenspan developed the uh, moniker of the of the maestro. But you see, the Fed respected the yield curve back then. They stopped tightening once the yield curve flattened. They didn't invert the yield curve. That's why you got the soft landings. Um, but those other Feds did not perceive that there was a, a real inflation problem that had to be dealt with. But this Fed does. Uh, so that's, I think, uh, one of the key differences. If we actually get through this, a Fed tightening cycle that inverts the yield curve without a recession, that'll be the first time that's ever happened. And if it does happen, and I'll give myself to the first quarter of next year, I will be the first one. I will wipe the egg off my face, and I'll write a report saying, I was wrong. The business cycle has been repealed after all. On this episode of the What the Finance podcast, I have the pleasure of welcoming back on David Rosenberg, who's the founder and president of Rosenberg Research and Associates. So, David, thanks so much for coming on the podcast again. Uh, great to be back on. Thank you. No problem. And I look forward to the conversation. We're just saying that not much has happened in the last seven months yeah. since we <laughs> since we spoke. It's definitely been uh, actually, yeah, it's been action packed. I think so much happened. And uh, and when we last spoke, we were sort of talking about how there's the risk of a recession moving forward, and there's sort of a potentially uh, going to be challenges in the economy. And I guess we did sort of see that in March, but then the Fed came in, they almost did like a, uh, you know, the, the Fed put and then save the markets. And since then the economy and markets have been going quite strong. Uh, so I guess, you know, do you think they save the market? So why do you think maybe we've seen this bounce that we have for the start of this year? Well, uh, I think that as far as the economy is concerned, uh, you know, what's happened uh, this year uh, that has thwarted the recession, uh, at least from a spending perspective, uh, has been, um, you know, the uh, the Energizer Bunny, uh, otherwise known as uh, the U.S. consumer, uh, you know, breathing the fumes from uh, the stimulus checks that were sent out to everybody, uh, you know, back in March of uh, 2021. And this has been a gift that's kept on giving. Uh, I think that uh, where a lot of us went wrong, including me, uh, was assuming that we were going to be seeing the same sort of behavior that we've seen in the past when American households, uh, who al we always know love to spend, uh, but when they get stimulus checks historically, uh, they spent half uh, and they saved half. Uh, and this time around, all of that $2.2 trillion, uh, it's a mind-boggling number, all of it got spent. And of course, you can't spend it all at once. Uh, so, you know, this theme of excess savings uh, that the macro bulls were talking about, well, they got that story right, and every penny of that stimulus was spent. Uh, and so that's really what the, um, you know, the, the primary story here is, uh, as far as the consumer is concerned. If consumers were just constrained by what's happened on real incomes, uh, you would have seen less than half the growth rate uh, in uh, real consumer spending that we've seen over the course of the past year. Uh, so, you know, that's been uh, the big part of the story, uh, that this lagged fiscal stimulus uh, kept uh, the consumer intact. Um, but that's really yesterday's story. The question is going to be, you know, what happens going forward? Uh, the student debt relief, uh, that falls by the wayside in the next month. Uh, the San Francisco Fed uh, published a report, uh, which seemed valid, which is that, um, you know, the last juice from the excess savings uh, file uh, terminates at the end of September. So we're going to find out going into the fourth quarter what the consumer looks like uh, stripped bare uh, of all the lag stimulus that's kept it alive and well over the course of the past uh, year or two. Have you been surprised by how like a strong the consumer has been with all these factors occurring? Yeah, well, by definition, I've been surprised because, you know, did I think that the savings rate, for example, was going to come all the way down to three and a half percent? Uh, I mean, the pre-COVID norm was 9%, we're at 3.5%. And uh, yeah, I, 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 this is just um, a, a interesting commentary on, on human behavior, because, you know, we went into the pandemic uh, with uh, 
over half of American households, close to two thirds, uh, didn't have uh, enough savings uh, to even get through three months of vital economic activity. Uh, and that's why the government felt so compelled to provide so much cash stimulus. And I think the view, uh, and this was also all sorts of academic research and Fed research showed that, you know, people tend to save half, spend half. So they went big because the government wanted people to spend more. And if you go back to that period, you know, in the opening months of 2020, I mean, there was a day where uh, the the um, the front um, oil price contract went negative. We were talking about deflation. Uh, and that was then, but the government went big. Uh, but everything got spent. And, and that, I think, was the... Um, uh, the big surprise, the big surprise is here we're sitting today that we're at a three and a half percent unemployment rate. Uh, if you look at the average over the past 10, 20, 30 years, it's more like 8%. And just before COVID hit, it was 9%. So, you know, that I think was the um, the big surprise. The big surprise was, you know, <laughs> that uh, we, we, we experienced something called YOLO. YOLO, right? YOLO, you only live once. Fill up that bucket list. Uh, and that's the psychological impact uh, of COVID. Uh, you only live once. So YOLO for Main Street uh, was what FOMO was uh, to Wall Street. You only live once. Anger spending. Um, and so that was really uh, the primary story. Now, the thing that we have to consider is that Fed policy uh, hits the economy with long lags. And, and the lags historically are two years. Um, so we haven't seen the full impact of what the Fed has already done. That's going to be staring us in the face at a time when this fiscal stimulus that's kept the Energizer bunny, that I like to call the consumer the Energizer bunny, but I think the batteries are going to run out by the time the fourth quarter rolls around. And, and at this point, uh, that's a little more than a month away. So what you see today, I don't think I don't think it's going to be what you see tomorrow. It reminds me a lot of 2007, you know, I'm at Mother Merrill. I'm calling for a recession, but I am crazy early, early to a fault. And everybody's asking, where's the recession? Where's the recession? But if you go back to that period of 2007, uh, what kept the Energizer Bunny alive back then wasn't lagged impact of fiscal stimulus or excess savings. It was the lagged impact of uh, the housing boom. So as you were trying to wonder, how is it that, you know, the Fed took the funds rate at that point from 1% at the low to five and a quarter percent at the high. And you're trying to explain to people that, look, this is a credit driven economy, that interest rates matter. But look, throughout all of 2007, remember the recession didn't start till December of 07. And throughout the whole year, people like me were wondering, you know, where's this recession already? And that's the question that I was receiving almost every single day in 2007. And next thing you know, it starts December 2007. Uh, which most people didn't even see happening, uh, nor like when you go into the summer of 08 uh, before Lehman and AIG and Merrill, the soft landing view was still winning, even though the NBER dated the recession to December of 07. But you see what kept the Energizer Bunny going, as I digress, was uh, other acronyms called MEW. Do you remember MEW, Anthony? Do you remember M-E-W, Mortgage Equity Withdrawal? No cash out refinancings. So that kept the consumer alive. We were seeing the last vestiges of the housing bubble boom providing cash flow, the last vestige of support for the consumer until it ended. And anybody who was willing to superimpose um, or extrapolate 2007 into 2008 uh, summarily got their heads chopped off. And I think we might relive that. Anybody who's extrapolating what happened this year into next year, especially as the fiscal stimulus fades, the lagged impact fades, uh, is summarily going to get their heads chopped off. But everybody seems to be doing that. Uh, everybody, I mean, you asked about the stock market. The stock market does not have my macro forecast. The stock market has gone hook, line, and sinker into the soft landing camp, as practically every economist has in the past few months on Wall Street. And you see that happening as well. I guess we we saw credit card debt recently go over a trillion. You could say there's sort of similar trends maybe with property prices going up. So maybe people are withdrawing equity from that. Are you seeing similar trends in comparisons to that period? You're not really seeing that uh, in the data. I mean, that's 
people the 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 um the refinancings are, are almost like 30 year lows i mean they're down more than 30 percent year over year and um yeah home prices are going back up but it's not the sign of a vibrant real estate market it's actually the sign of a very depressed housing market uh now there's 15 percent of home sales that are new home sales and that's what the valve has been for any growth in housing um because we have no supply i mean you, what are we talking about three months of supply in the existing housing market nobody's listing their homes so if you want to buy a home you have to go to the builders and that's why the home building stocks have been such a great place to be but let's just say that when you're taking a look at this from a economic standpoint holistic standpoint new home sales which might drive you know the um the hgx or the home building index and the s&p 500 85 percent of the sales in the real estate market nationally are in the existing market in the resale market which is completely moribund there's no supply there's no demand the demand demand is down more than 20 percent over the past year all the demand's been in the new market you have a depressed resale market and so you've got um just two very inelastic curves you got an inelastic supply curve <clears throat> you got inelastic demand curve and i guess what you would say is well the supply is tighter then the demand is weaker and that's the ingredients for the sort of real estate inflation we're seeing right now uh this is not really demand driven it's really because there's, the supplies are so tight but the flip side of that you know when people talk about that 85 percent of homeowners locked into those low rate mortgages back in 2020 2021 they become prisoners in their home uh you know they they can't uh refinance they don't they can't move uh or else they'll have to refinance that you know rates instead of being at three or four percent or more like you know seven and a half seven three quarters percent and there's all sorts of talk, well, that people will, if they do that, they'll rent out their homes, so on and so forth. Okay, that much is true, but we've created a, more of a really sclerotic housing market. Uh, it's a very weird housing market. And I don't know if I would treat the rise in home prices as something that is going to have some sort of positive wealth effect um, on spending. And I'm not even so sure that you can talk about, well, look what the stock market's done this year. Okay, sure, uh, we can talk about that. But do we talk about what the stock market's done this year without looking at it in the context of what happened last year? Um, do we look at the stock market? You see, when you're taking a look at wealth effects on spending from asset prices, you have to take a look at it over long periods of time. You can't take a look at it, oh, stock market did this, housing market did this in three or four months. No, it's, it's actually when you do um, the wealth effect on spending, it's on two things, really. It's... Uh, comes down to Milton Friedman's permanent income hypothesis. How do people, do people perceive these asset gains as being permanent, but also it has to be really looked at on a trend basis. So you tell me, stock market, bull market or bear market, the stock market is flat. It's actually down fractionally over the past two years. Is that a bull market? I, I never seen a bull market where over a 24 month period, the S&P 500 is basically flat. All you've done is pick up the dividend and a whole lot of volatility. But because everybody lives in the here and now, uh, and most people have short time horizons and can't look past the tip of their nose, they think we're in a bull market. They think we're in a bull market, Anthony, until I draw them the chart of the two-year percent change in the S&P 500, which, by the way, I said is flat. It's actually for actually negative. <laughs> So you picked up the dividend and you picked up a ton of volatility and a lot of sleepless nights. So uh, I don't know. I'm not in the camp that believes you're on a bull market in assets. Um, and you could say, well, look at the case Shiller. We're up three, four months in a row. Yeah, but we're still actually fractionally negative on a year-over-year -year basis. Home prices aren't collapsing, but the trend is still fractionally negative. In the stock market, the trend, notwithstanding what happened this year, which is a recovery from the detonation last year, uh, is flat over two years. So actually, in answer to your question, there is no positive wealth effect on spending. That's not happening. And the key is going to be what happens with the labor market and how does that impact uh, uh, incomes. Uh, and then on top of that, where is the savings rate going? You see, that is to me what the easy call is. The easy call, like 
three and a half percent on the employment, three and a half percent on the savings rate. We started the cycle at nine. We went to like 33 because of COVID, because we couldn't spend. We were locked in our homes, and now we're down to three and a half. So where are we going down to zero? Like we have no more impetus to spending, no more impetus to spending from a declining savings rate. And what if that savings rate, God forbid, mean reverts back to 9%? What if we do a round trip on the savings rate? And what people don't know is that this is just pure math. It's not even an opinion. That if we have the prevailing trend in real incomes uh, and the savings rate mean reverts in the next year, real consumer spending is going to be negative 1%. Between now, say, and the second half of 2024. So how do you escape a recession with that math? Now, if you have a view that the savings rate will just go down to zero, well, you know, this is a case, I guess, where your assumptions will drive your conclusions. But you see, I am a disciple of Bob Farrell. And Bob Farrell's market rule number one is all about mean reversion. So we have a mean of 8 to 9% on the personal savings rate, which I would argue, I know people will roll their eyes. What's he talking about the personal savings rate? It is arguably the most important behavioral aggregate in the national accounts. So you mean revert that series. And we just trend out what incomes are doing. And, and probably income growth probably slows because we're seeing the labor market cool off. A consumer recession is inescapable. It's only going to be a question of how bad, not whether. Yeah, and this is all, as you said there, it's all linked to the employment. And, you, you know, it sounds like hat, spending, saving, uh, you know, houses, you're trapped in your home. All of that's okay if you have a job. But once, as you said, once the labor market cools, once people get put out of work, and that's when it seems like that's really, it's really going to come to the forefront that there's an issue with everything that's happening. Yeah, and don't forget that, um, you know, employment is a coincident indicator. And that's what's interesting to me is um, you got the Fed. And the Fed's got a, a free pass. I mean, you come out of Jackson Hole and uh, the media and the academics, <clears throat> Wall Street, they're just like, this is like, this is the best Fed since sliced bread. Jay Powell, he's just, he's just amazing. And 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 um, I, I find it absolutely uh, incredible uh, about the complacency. Uh, the Fed was shamed into this aggressive tightening cycle, ashamed. Uh, because it missed the 9% inflation rate in the summer of 2022. Uh, and it has total political cover. Uh, and so it's um, going to make be making uh, another mistake in the opposite direction. Uh, not that we haven't seen this before. It's why we have business cycles. The Fed over eases uh, and then it over tightens. Now, it's focused on service sector inflation which is actually one of the components of the conference board's index of lagging economic indicators. It's focused on the unemployment rate, which is one of the components of the index of lagging indicators. And the Fed is consumed with non-farm payrolls, despite all its imperfections. Despite the fact that um, we just got news of a 306,000 downward revision in the year to March of 2023, and we know that non-farm payrolls have been downwardly revised every month this year by a combined 270,000, yet everybody and their mother will be trading aggressively at 8.30 in the morning when non-farm payrolls come out without realizing that this is going to be getting revised and revised and revised, and the revisions have been lower. So you see, what you see isn't always what you get, but we're going to trade off these numbers. <clears throat> but the leading economic indicator, the the uh, labor market <clears throat> component that's in the index, excuse me, <clears throat> of uh, leading economic indicators uh, is the work week. And employers have taken the work week down to the lowest level since April of 2020. The work week is a leading indicator because the turning points in the cycle and turning points can often last a year. Companies cut the hours before they cut the bodies. It's a leading indicator. And so <clears throat> I think that it's just a matter of timing before we start to see the employment contraction. I understand the psychological scarring that took place among small businesses in particular, or even big businesses that couldn't find all the displaced labor 
uh, that came out of COVID. And uh, there is labor hoarding going on. But uh, employment does follow the cycle. And you see, the thing is that it's not employment does not cause the recession. The recession causes the decline in employment. The impact on spending influences employment. And then you get into this um, this reinforcing cycle. It, it occurs in, when you finish recessions and you go into expansion or you finish expansions, go to recession. So people that think that we get a get it a jail free card on employment, I think they're going to be, um, uh, you know, mistaken on that view. Uh, and uh, so I think that by the fourth quarter, we're going to start to see employment weaken a lot. Now, whether we get outright contraction, well, we'll see about that. I think we will. But even if we don't, people will be coming back into the labor market to look for a job. And that dynamic alone, with or without employment contraction, is going to take the unemployment rate higher. And what does a higher unemployment rate do? It signifies that we are shifting from excess demand to excess supply in the jobs market, and that's going to put downward pressure on wages. So you don't even have to have this dire forecast of like that there's going to be millions and millions of jobs being lost. You just need to have a forecast where the supply of labor is going to be going up. And even if employment doesn't contract for reasons that I stated, maybe companies will continue to try and hoard labor. But people will come back into the labor force. And, and the reason I say that is that one of the greatest leading indicators for labor force entry is the number of people in the market, in the labor market, that are taking on more than one job. And, you know, that's what's happening is that in the past four months, the number of multiple job holders have surged. We see in some sense that's double counting. You have a lot of people that are taking on more than one job. And that's a contra-cyclical indicator. That's an indicator of stress. It's happened at the same time, for example, that credit card delinquency rates have already broken above the levels they had during the pandemic. You were seeing signs of consumer stress at the margin. It's not everybody, but recessions always start at the margin. And you're seeing the marginal household, marginal consumer feeling the effects of what the Fed has already done. And so that's how you build a case for rising unemployment rate, declining wage growth, rising savings rate. You don't have to be Darth Vader. You don't have to be the world's most bearish economist to see what's staring us in the face. And what's staring us in the face is not what's priced in the financial assets right now. Yeah, you imagine even if each unemployment goes back to the main sort of closest to 6%, and that would be, as you said, it would sort of be weaker and it would probably have a similar effect to what, that, what you're that, suggesting that, here. And that, believe it or not, a 6% unemployment rate would be a deep recession. I mean, you'd be talking about a two and a half percentage point increase. You see, it's not the level of the unemployment rate that dictates the severity of the recession. It's the change. Um, and uh, the Fed itself is just saying four and a half percent. And maybe they're right. Maybe they have this labor hoarding impact in their models. But the bottom line is you go from three and a half to four and a half, you're in recession. Uh, pretty well, any time that you are up at least a half a percentage point off the cycle low, you're already in recession. It does not take a lot. Everything changes at the margin. And people say to me, well, you know, but 4% unemployment, that's going to that's gonna take the economy in recession. Yeah, you know, take a look what happened. We had a 3.5% or thereabouts unemployment rate, uh, you know, during the tech boom of 99 and the 2000. And it uh, didn't take much by the time the recession started. Yeah, you're talking about unemployment rate at 4. The recession's, the recession's already started at that point. And that's why it's a lagging indicator. Yeah. So, so earlier in the interview, you compared so there's this some similar similarities to 2008, but it sounds like that's not your base case. You don't think it's going to be maybe such a deep deep recession. Is that correct? I, I'm not sure it's going to be a deep recession, uh, and we don't have nearly the same degree of imbalances that we had even back in 2000 or in 2008. We don't have uh, those serious imbalances, whether it's in excess. Um, leverage and uh, overbuilding in tech capex, which is what the story was in 2000, 2001. And uh, we don't have um, an excessive leverage in residential mortgages, uh, which is the bedrock of the system and, and housing. This is, this is different. Um, the imbalances aren't as acute. But we've had other recessions where we didn't have massive imbalances, where interest rates went up. And uh, discretionary spending went down. 
Uh, you don't always have to, we're not, you know, we don't always relive the same war and lightning doesn't strike twice. You know, each one of these recessions or even expansions have their, have recurring patterns. Uh, they also have their own peculiarities. But the major point here is that the U.S. economy is a credit-driven economy. Interest rates are extremely important uh, for valuing long duration assets. They are very important. You see, people have a very myopic view. They say, well, look at the homeowners. They've been saved because um, they're not getting hit by the debt service because they've locked in their mortgages. Okay. Or they say, well, look at the corporate sector back in 2020, 2021. They, they, they termed out their debt. Fine. That's not what creates the recession. What creates the recession is that interest rates go up and it impairs new expenditures on interest-sensitive spending. Um, and that usually is in the durable goods sector. Now, people say, well, services will be okay. Well, why will services be okay? Services, by definition, service the goods producers. Service producers. They don't really produce anything, okay? Uh, they service the part of society and the economy that actually makes something. <laughs> so to say, oh, well, services will be fine. No, no, no. That's looking at the economy in what's called a partial equilibrium uh, framework. A static framework. No, there's all sorts of spillover effects, knock-on impacts, multiplier influences on the rest of the economy that start from the bottom of the period, which is durable goods production and consumption. And that's interest sensitive. So people say to me, well, we're not going to get hit by debt service impairment. Okay, run with that story. But that's not the real story. The real story is what do interest rates do to the ability to afford a new car, new furniture, a new home, things that you actually have to finance. Most people don't have the money to buy these things out of pocket. That's the impact of interest rates uh, on spending. When I hear about, oh, well, the corporate sector, they've turned out all their debt. Uh, there's not going to be any debt servicing impairment. Okay. Like I say, run with that story. But you see what happens is that when interest rates go up and you're a business and you are trying to estimate uh, what is your long-term rate of return on the investment of the fresh capital you're going to put to work, benchmarked against uh, your cost of capital. Well, one thing when rates are zero, and one thing when rates are 5%. In the corporate sector, they're a lot higher. So the decision to embark on a capital spending project, which of course also has impact on employment, is materially changed because of what interest rates did. But because the recession hasn't happened yet, uh, it's been delayed, it's not been derailed, but you have everybody thinking it's got to be a soft landing because it hasn't arrived yet. And that's only because everybody lives in the here and now. And this current version of the Fed has trained everybody to focus on contemporaneous and lagging indicators. They're going to be in for a real rude surprise uh, towards the end of this year and into 2024. And so interest rates do matter. They've always mattered. They still matter. And we have a situation where credit availability, not just the cost, has become more constricted. So people will say, well, we just dodged this bullet with, uh, you know, Silicon Valley Bank and you know, um, uh, you know, First Republic, and if, you know, there's been no ripple effects, and no, but there have been, there have been ripple effects actually, because when you look at the chart of commercial bank deposits, and you look at the chart of commercial bank credit, they're both contracting. Now they're not contracting at an alarming rate, but we are into a credit contraction. So the availability of credits being constrained, we're dealing at a much more pernicious, I mean, the highest interest rate environment in two decades and the most pernicious Fed tightening cycle since 1981. And somehow the business cycle has been repealed. I get that all the time. I get that all the time, Anthony. People say to me, my clients, other pundits, interest rates don't matter. 
interest rates don't matter anymore. I'm hearing all the time that the U.S. economy has become interest insensitive. And it reminds me of when I think it was Robert Toll from Toll Brothers back in 2006 went on CNBC and famously said that our business, the housing industry, is no longer cyclical. Now, I fell off my chair laughing at that point, but uh, let's face it, it, it took a year for the recession to unfold and for people to realize, no, guess what? Housing is cyclical. So I hear this uh, nonsense, the interest that the economy is interest sensitive. Uh, and uh, I just, uh, you know, after doing, after being in the business 40 years, I could tell you, I, I've heard it all. And, and people are just confusing policy lags to what is coming down the pike. And nobody can time it perfectly. I'll just say this much. Historically, the lag from the first Fed rate hike to the inevitable recession, and I say inevitable because I don't think recessions are unicorns. I don't think they're fairy tales. They are attached to the expansions, just as the expansions are tied to the recessions. Uh, the business cycle has not been repealed. And so, you know, that's where, you know, I, I fall out is that, um, is that the average lag, the norm, the mean, what's normal is it takes 22 months now, people could say there's no recession, but I would say that when the Fed tightens policy and continues to tighten policy into an inverted yield curve, and there's nothing magical about the inverted yield curve, except it is the bond market's way to tell the Fed you've basically gone too far. This Fed has either ignored the message from the yield curve or that this Fed is willing to take on the recession to crush inflation. This this Fed is, you know, Powell came out and said that... Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, we're not going to three percent target. We are at square four, uh, four square at at two percent. Uh, and they're putting the genie in the bottle, and they're going to make sure the genie stays in the bottle. Uh, and if it takes a recession, so be it. That's why he compares himself to Paul Volcker whenever he gets a chance. Paul Volcker was the last Fed chairman to willingly push the economy in a recession to generate rapid disinflation. So Powell does not compare himself to Bernanke, doesn't compare himself to Greenspan or Janet Yellen or McChesney Martin for that matter. God forbid, not Arthur Burns. He just compares himself to Paul Volcker. Well, Anthony, what more evidence do you need? Paul Volcker created the conditions for back-to-back -back recessions to crush inflation. He compares himself to Paul Volcker. Paul Volcker was the inflation killer because he generated negative demand to get what he wanted. And we're supposed to think that we're coming out of this with a soft landing, the most pernicious tightening cycle since 1981. We had the fit, the lagged impact of the fiscal stimulus, like I said, sort of um, acted as a um, as an antidote uh, to what's happening on the monetary side. But we know that there's 22 months of a lag between the first Fed rate hike and the recession. And the first Fed rate hike was March 2022, which means that either the fourth quarter of this year or the first quarter of next year have a, a bullseye on this forehead. Now, you know, we've had three soft landings. Uh, we've had 14 Fed tightening cycles since 1950, 11 recessions out of the 14, but we have three soft landings, three soft landings in the mid sixties, mid eighties and mid nineties. In the mid nineties is when Alan Greenspan developed the uh, moniker of the, of the maestro. But you see, the Fed respected the yield curve back then. They stopped tightening once the yield curve flattened. They didn't invert the yield curve. That's why you got the soft landings. Um, but those other Feds did not perceive that there was a, a real inflation problem that had to be dealt with. But this Fed does. Uh, so that's, I think, uh, one of the key differences. If we actually get through this, a Fed tightening cycle that inverts the yield curve without a recession, that'll be the first time that's ever happened. And if it does happen, and I'll give myself to the first quarter of next year, I will be the first one. I will wipe the egg off my face and I'll write a report saying, I was wrong. The business cycle has been repealed after all. Yeah, it'd be hard to imagine that happening. So, well, uh, I'll meant... start. I'll start putting. Uh, I don't know. I'll start putting teeth under my pillow and hope that uh, 
to see hope to see some bitcoin under my pillow i mean but look <laughs> you know uh the, the lags will last only so long but uh, that's my expectation and look i will be the first one to say uncle i did that look i i said but back in 07 i said if this recession doesn't start by the first quarter of 08 i'm throwing in the towel but you see what happened you see what happened right and the lags were long then too you see what happened recession started in december of 07 And all the people at Merrill Lynch in 07 that were calling me the skunk at the picnic couldn't take me out to see enough clients in 2008. But let me tell you something. In 07, I was the biggest dummy in the world. No, And back then, once again, uh, China, there was global decoupling. What else? China super cycle, commodity super cycle. Remember, there was a while there in the summer of 08 when inflation almost got to 6%. Commodity super cycle, global decoupling, China, 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 China. Okay. Right. Always comes in cycles. Uh, so I'm assuming that you mentioned there that obviously, and we know that Jay Powell was very late to the inflation party. So I'm assuming that you think it's going to be very late to the cutting party and it could cause mm. massive damage in, throughout the economy. Well, that's what they're saying now. And I think, they, I think they've over tightened and they probably will be late. And, and, and it won't be the first time. Um, you know, even Alan Greenspan, who never really felt the need to crush inflation because he didn't really have to, was late. Um, who was later than Ben Bernanke? <laughs> who was later than Ben Bernanke, who told us that, um, what did he tell us in uh, in, in 07, that home prices never go down nationwide, that the problems in subprime shall remain contained. The problems in subprime shall remain contained. Uh, by the time they started cutting rates, which was starting in the summer of 07, it, it was too late. And the recession started in December of 07. You know, Greenspan back in 2000, you go back and read what he was saying back in 2000. Uh, it was all about, well, this is a um, uh, excess inventory, excess inventory cycle in technology. And by January of 01, he's cutting rates 50 basis points in their meeting because he realizes, oops, no, this is actually a, a deflationary detonation in the technology capital stock. So what's it going to be next, right? I mean, look, you asked me about the Fed. Same Fed that preached transitory. Now they're preaching higher for longer. Really, the same group that preached transitory and if you bet against transitory, you made a lot of money, are now preaching higher for longer. So I think sometimes you have to pick your points as to when you want to bet against the Fed. Maybe you want to bet against the Fed uh, at turning points. Maybe you want to bet against the Fed when uh, they're telling you that it's transitory, but yet inflation is moving from zero to 9%. And maybe you want to bet the other way when they're telling you higher for longer when inflation goes from 9% down to 3%. Uh, same Fed that told us in the summer of 2021. So I'm not going back 5, 10, 15, or 100 years. We're going back two years. When this Fed first unveiled its 2023 dot plots, okay? This is the summer of 2021. Their median dot plot for the end of this year. You know what it was, Anthony? You know what it was? Five eighths of a percent. Five-eighths. Five-eighths. We're, now we're going to be five and five-eighths. Let's just add, oh, let's add five percentage points to that number, okay? So, like, and everybody, you know, Jackson Hole, we just have to latch on to every single word and uh, syllable and what's Powell going to say and all these other people, you know, I, I just shake my head. Uh, I think that the higher for longer will prove to have the same shelf life as transitory okay now the the fed the fed district bank that does the best research is the san fran fed uh followed by new york and especially the liberty blog liberty blog is very good the san fran fed letter should be a must read for everybody okay so they come out a few weeks ago, the San Fran Fed, and they say, oh, guess what? We did this modeling, and we found that you know the way that the rental measures and the CPI are constructed, don't forget that's 30% of the index and 40% of the core. 
that when we follow through all the current leasing activity and what we're seeing down the pike and then as the old leasing activity that was at much higher rent rental rates fall out of the data they come out and say that by this time next year the year over year trend in the rental components and you know you get the rental components right forget energy forget food forget car rental prices you get the rents right in the cpi and you're going to get your inflation forecast right because it's by far the biggest component so they're saying it's going to be flat to negative flat to negative so you, you know what that means flat to negative it means you're going to be slicing two and a half percentage points off the headline inflation rate in the next 12 months you're going to be slicing two and a half percentage points off of a year-over-year -year percent change in the cpi that's around three percent so you're talking about that by this time next year. And again, you got to draw an assumption that everything else in the CPI falls into place. And let's say it's just at the same trend that it's at today. Uh, inflation this time next year could be 0.5 to 1.0%. 0.5 to 1.0. And so we're going to be higher for longer. <laughs> we get down to 0.5 to 1. It, it means that the real rate the real policy rate is going to go to like four and a half percent. The real policy rate is going to go to four and a half percent where you have the New York Fed telling you that the neutral real funds rate is around 0.5. So higher for longer, they're going to be holding the real funds rate 400 basis points above neutral. Really? So no, I am seriously fading, seriously fading higher for longer. Like I said, it will have the same shelf life as transitory did, which isn't too long. It sounds like when they try and go absolutes and, you know, almost try and make a point to people, that's when they're, <laughs> they're always wrong and it, it goes the other way to what they expect. So if it, when that happens or if that were to happen, what do you see happening, I guess, in the asset markets? Which assets do you think will struggle? It sounds like, you know, stocks and equities might struggle. Yep. Bonds might go up. What are you seeing in that department? I think that, uh, I think the odds still favor a recession. Uh, in recessions, the stock market goes down 30%. Uh, on top of that, what's the math? What What is the math? Like what, what will get people excited for the next cycle? It's not going to be at an equity risk premium south of 100 basis points. And if you look historically at fundamental lows, fundamental recession lows in the S&P, you usually get stupid cheap. And the market's not stupid cheap. Uh, usually the equity risk premium is closer to 400 basis points. So, I mean, that would take you to a 10-year note yield of around 3%. Probably takes you down an S&P down closer to 3,400. And those are the numbers I'm playing with. And I'm being extraordinarily patient. And along the way, uh, I think bond yields have peaked. Uh, I like the treasury market. Then you're getting paid. You know, cash is king. You're getting paid to be in cash. So I like cash. I like long bonds because there's never been, I, I just, once again, this is a case where your, your assumptions drive your conclusions. My assumption is that we're getting a recession. You've never had a bull market in equities in a recession. Stock market goes down 30% in recessions. And then you have to do the math as to at what point do we bottom and an equity risk premium closer to 400 than 100 basis points. To me, that's easy. Uh, and we've never had a situation where the treasury market failed to make you money in a recession. You just get a natural flight to safety, flight to quality. So I like treasuries. I like long dated treasuries. Uh, I do not like the stock market, but if I had to be invested in equities, I'd want to be in the areas that are shielded the most against a recession. So that would include what? Healthcare, utilities, consumer staples. Um, and I would almost limit it to that. And if I had to have toes in the global stock market, uh, I'd want to be in areas of the world where there's a secular tailwind, where there's a secular re-rating. Uh, and Japan comes to mind the most. And, and Japan has been consistently uh, our top stock market call. Uh, we all focus on the NASDAQ 100. When that's not working, we focus on the S&P or 
S and P equal weighted, but the Japan's up 25% this year. And it's not because of anything cyclical and it's not even because of the bank of Japan. Uh, it's really because of one other lag that's taking place globally, but it's a positive lag, which is the lag of, uh, Abenomics, the lags of, uh, Abe's legacy in terms of, uh, creating the conditions for, uh, a, an equity culture taking place in Japan. There's an equity culture taking place in Japan that looks a lot like the U.S. in 1982. There's an equity culture developing. Uh, and the Japanese corporate sector, you know, there was a time when dividend payout in Japan, I don't know how to say it in Japanese, but it was an oxymoron, whatever, however you pronounce it. Dividend, now you're saying dividend payouts, dividend growth, dividend yield are amongst the best in the world. Con Japanese companies are finally moving cash off the balance sheet massive amounts of cash in a shareholder returns and japan has one of the most impressive um all-in equity yields in the world uh and so i think there's a secular re-rating going there so if i have to be in the equity market and i, I don't believe in zero or 100 in anything you don't been in the business long enough to know that you don't put all your eggs in one basket and there's no such thing as a sure thing uh and insofar as you have to be invested in equities and if you have the capacity to be a global investor uh japan is by and far and away uh our preferred market uh and um that might be an area that could decouple uh from a u.s bear market uh, but i think you will be hurt less being in japan uh than you will um than you will elsewhere and within sectors, as I said, if you're in the S&P 500, uh, I think that the more defensive, less economically sensitive, the better. And uh, I think that um, we are basically what we are peak, past peak growth. Uh, we are past peak inflation. We are past peak credit cycle. And so where do you want to be? Where do you want to be? You want to be in treasuries. Uh, and maybe you don't want to be so bold as to take on the duration risk to be in 30 years or, or in zero coupon bonds, but you can take on a laddered approach. But we are at peak rates. And whether or not the Fed has one more rate hike in its arsenal is like chasing a quarter in front of a steamroller. I mean, who cares? Where's the next big move in rates, Anthony? Where, after we've had a monstrosity of a 525 basis point cycle, where is the next big move in rates? Yeah. Powerful question. It's 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 by definition it's lower. And uh, and so I am bullish. What can I say? I am I'm bullish on rates. Full stop. Yeah, it seems asymmetric from an asymmetric risk perspective. It's more so much more likely that it's going to go. Down well, I love right and I love that. Look, I love the consensus view. Higher for longer. That that's been bought in hook, line, and sinker. Uh, you know, secular inflation. I'm still getting questions today as to whether or not we're heading into the 1970s. You know, we just had a um <laughs> in the in the past three months, the core PC deflator <laughs> is running at a 2.1% annual rate. And in the 1970s, that happened two percent of the time. And today it's right in front of us. And I get, I'm still getting questions. And I love that one. More and more questions about the 1970s. I love that. I can see where the consensus is. Nobody's asking me about deflation. Now, when everybody was asking me about deflation in 2020, maybe that was a sign and learning lesson for me. Everybody's on deflation. The consensus is too one-sided. You know, it's back to one of Bob Farrell's famous 10 marker rules to remember. When all the experts and forecasts agree, something else is going to happen. And I can't go through a day asked about secular inflation, uh, asked about um, uh, about higher for longer. Uh, and um, I don't believe in new eras. So that's basically it. Like I said, though, I, I'll keep an open mind. I'll keep an open mind. I will basically tell the world, if this recession hasn't happened by the first quarter of next year, I will tell the world that the uh, business cycle has been repealed um, and that, uh, how does the song go? How does that song go? Do you believe in magic? I'll say, I believe in magic. <laughs> magic and fairy tales. Uh, I'll, I'll write that. I'll write that. First quarter of next year, I'll write that. Basically, I am now 
going to, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I, I haven't lost any of my teeth, but if I do, believe me, they, they will find its way underneath my pillow if there's not a recession by the first quarter of next year. David, thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Uh, my last question is, is, what is one message you want people to take away from our conversation? Or was that it? I'd say, play, you know, play, play it safe. Play it safe. You know, uh, I'd say that um, uh, that uh, uh, the business cycle has not been repealed. Uh, do not follow the herd. And um, I think the theme for me for 2024 is going to be better safe than sorry. Great message. So thanks so much for coming on today. I really appreciate it. Uh, if anyone wanted to find out more about your work and what you do, would it be Dave Rosenberg uh, research or is there anywhere else people can find it? You can just, uh, just, you know, you can Google Rosenberg research uh, or you can do uh, information at Rosenberg uh, You know, I got a Twitter handle, but I can never remember what it is. Uh, we I have a, I have a YouTube channel too, but if you come on the website and you just fill in a, form that'll take you 30 seconds to do everybody will have 30 day free trial access to 30 days of everything i do daily weekly and for the month uh and so uh, i like people to taste uh taste my wares um uh for a full month uh before they make up their minds as to uh, what it is they'd like to purchase from me so you get uh, complete access 30 days uh my favorite my favorite four-letter word that starts with F, which is free, uh, but also dovetails nicely with my uh, disinflation projection. So please, uh, I invite you to come on the website, check it out, and uh, and check out the free trial. Perfect. I'll put that in the description below. So thanks again for your time. Yeah, you too, Anthony. All the best. Thank you so much for listening. And if you enjoyed the episode, please subscribe and click the bell icon so you are notified when new podcasts are released. I hope you're leaving with some great value about investing, trading, and finance. See you on the next show.